morning again, everybody. So glad you're here today. My name is Joel Dorman. I'm the lead pastor here. And if you're joining us online, we want to say a special welcome to you as well. We know there are various reasons why people join us online, but we know there's a certain group of you that watch online because you're checking us out. We know you're there. We're glad you're doing that. And we're going to be so excited when you go from there to here and you'll find a warm greeting and you'll see that we just want to love God and love people and we want to love you as well. So thanks for joining us, whatever the reason you find yourself online as well. Now, those of you who are joining us online know this right now in real time, but I would imagine that the vast majority of us are fully aware that you can waste a lot of time on the internet. You can do something so simple as typing in a search term into your favorite search engine, and like an hour later, you're watching a dog saving its owner from a rushing river. And you're like, I just started off trying to find, you know, something to buy. You know, you had to do some genuine shopping, and you're trying to find an answer. I mean, we, we just, that's just kind of the nature of what happens. And we get so distracted by it, and we have all this information that back in 2003, then Google CEO Eric Schmidt said that we produce more information every two days than we produced in all of written history from the beginning to that point in 2003. And he, he bragged at that point that at that time, Google had indexed over 45 billion pages of information. And I can only imagine in 2022, that number is far, far higher. But we have so much information that sociologists tell us that we can't even keep up with it anymore. Information comes at us so fast, we can't even process it as fast as it's coming at us, which is why we end up watching dog videos when we're doing something else. It would just get so distracted because it's, there's just so much at us. It's even changed how we view, like literally look at pages of information. It's changed how we actually uh, ingest information. If you don't believe me, if you're a baby boomer or a Gen X or like me, Go ask a millennial or a Gen Zer how they look at a website. Just ask them. Most of us, if you're older than like 45, you read left to right. You go to the next line, left to right. Digital natives don't read that way. They skim the top, they skim down the right side of the page, and then they decide if they're going to read the rest. It's changed how we actually look at information because there's so much of it. We have to, our brains have to find a way to condense this down because we can enter even search terms for Christian things. We can try to figure out how do Christians feel about a certain issue or what does the Bible say about a certain issue. And next thing you know, we're doing the equivalent of dog videos. I mean, you just have this side debating this and this side debating that, and you have all these opinions and thoughts, and you're just going, I'm just trying to find a simple answer. And you've gone down this rabbit hole of, of information trying to sort it out and figure it out and you're left sometimes with more questions than you have answers and in those moments what, what, are you, what are you supposed to do with that I mean you know some stuff if you're a follower of Jesus if you're a disciple of Jesus if you're a Christian then you know that God has called you out of darkness into his wondrous light you know that you're to, you're to walk that calling out you know that much but you just don't know how to do it you don't know what's supposed to happen next. You're not, supposed to, you're not sure what to do with this information now that it's come at you because what you do know seems clear enough, but boy, what you don't know can be real confusing. So what do you do when you've been called out? What's next? What do you do after that? And today as we get back in our message series, The Greatest Stories Rarely Told, we're talking about just that. What do you do when you've been called out, been called out by the Almighty? Now what? What's the next step? We're in Exodus chapter 3 to talk about this. Most of our series so far, actually all of our series so far, we've been in Genesis. And at this pace, it would take us a few years. But we're actually picking up speed. Uh, we're spending most, most of this year going through the Old Testament in this greatest story is rarely told. And today we start in Exodus, and it really picks up steam after this. But Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 22, it's pages 39 and 40 in the Pew Bible there in front of you. And if you don't have a print copy of the Bible for your own and you would like one, please keep this as a gift from us to you. Nothing would thrill us more than to know you kept this. Or it, maybe you have a friend or a family member or a neighbor you want to give this to and you think they might, well, we, we know they'll benefit from it, but maybe you think they might think they'd benefit. Take it, take it, take stacks of these. That'd be fantastic. So as we enter in the book of Exodus, specifically Exodus chapter 3, we're now introduced to someone in the Bible that we're going to hear a lot about like through the very end. His name comes up all the time, and his name is Moses. So who is this man named Moses? 
So in this series, The Greatest Story is Rarely Told, we confess nearly every week we're not hitting everything. We can't. It would take us years, and we've decided to do this within one year. So we've got to summarize some stuff. So let me give you some basics on who Moses is. Moses is the son of a a Jewish couple, Amram and Jochebed. He's a Jewish man with an Egyptian name, kind of. His name is actually a hybrid between Egyptian and, and, and Hebrew. Fascinating story. So his mom, Jochebed, okay, gives birth to a little baby unnamed. You're going to find out why in a minute. But Pharaoh had noticed that all these Jewish, all these Hebrew slaves had begun multiplying. They kept having so many babies. Pharaoh's got a problem because the slaves are about to outnumber the Egyptians. So he issues this terrible edict that all the children of the two should be killed. Jochebed goes, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. She builds a little ark and she pushes her baby out into the Nile and literally hands him over to God. But who would happen to find this little baby floating through this little ark down the Nile than Pharaoh's own daughter, who pulls him out of the water, names him Moses, because she pulled him out of the reeds, out of the water, has this hybrid name. She knew he was a Hebrew baby. And then, as the Lord would have it, she ends up getting, unbeknownst to her, his own mother to nurse him and to be his nanny. I mean, how cool is this? But he's still raised in Pharaoh's court. Now, which pharaoh was this? The popular one is Ramses. That's the one if you watch Prince of Egypt. That's kind of the angle they take. Uh, Thutmose III has a lot of promise. He could have been the pharaoh. It might have actually been Thutmose III's dad. Uh, it might have been Amenhotep. I mean, it, you have some kind of interesting Amenhotep II, for those of you who are history buffs. There's a difference between the first and the second. We don't know which pharaoh it was, and we don't know who the next pharaoh was. We don't know that information. What we do know is this guy named Moses is raised in Pharaoh's court. He is raised like a brother, technically a cousin, okay, because Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, so it's technically Pharaoh's son is his cousin. But the point is, he's raised like a brother to the next Pharaoh. That's, that's what, that was Moses' life. He's educated as an Egyptian. He's raised as an Egyptian. He knows Egyptian religion. He knows all their gods. He knows everything about that. He's trained in military conquest. He's trained like a son of Pharaoh. But he knew the whole time that he was still not Egyptian. He knew he was a Hebrew. And one day he happened to see an Egyptian taskmaster mistreating a Hebrew slave. And Moses got so angry that he killed the Egyptian. So now Moses, the guy that really just kind of lucked out and managed to be in Pharaoh's court, has become the murderer of an Egyptian man. Moses runs, and he heads for the hills. Well, now he has a new start on life. He started over. He's got a family now. He's in, he's in a family. He's tending sheep. It's been 40 years. Egypt is a long way behind. He's done with Egypt until he receives a call from a burning bush. And that's where we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 3. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. So Moses isn't sure if this was the heat getting to him. Maybe some bad mushrooms there on the side of the mountain, but there's a bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. That's a strange sight. Scripture's already hinting at us a few things. It tells us that the angel of the Lord appeared. Now, many times in the Old Testament, when you have that phrase, the angel of the Lord, it is usually God himself. Most of us think this is actually Jesus before Bethlehem. This was the Son of God, okay, doing this. Well, Jesus is there. He just has a different name in the Old Testament, but he's there. He's acting like God. He's talking like God, and there's this bush that's on fire. Fire is most often associated with God. So you have all these hints that the the author is telling us right up front, this is the Lord, but Moses doesn't know that yet. So don't tell him yet because he's about to discover this. So he knew this was odd. He goes on in verses 4 through 6. And we read this, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, 
the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, I want you to bear in mind that in all likelihood, Moses did not know who this was before he said this. He was raised as an Egyptian. There's not much evidence to show that he had known much about what the Hebrews believed. If he did, it would have been more academic. This wasn't his world. And he was a long way from Egypt, and he was a long way from the Hebrew people. And here he is now on Mount Horeb, which, spoiler alert, in just a few chapters, we hear it called another name, Sinai, which is where God gives the Ten Commandments. But that hasn't happened yet. And so Moses is standing there at this place that he has now discovered is holy, and it's the introduction of something very big God is about to tell Moses, because he thought Egypt was a long way behind, but he was being given a mission to free God's people. So verses 7 through 10, the Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, which is the Bible's way of saying it has a lot of provision. There's a lot of things in the land to eat and a lot of good resources in the land. And he defines that. He says the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, basically all the corners of the promised land. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now this takes us back, or it should, okay? It should take us back to May 29th, just a month ago, when we went through Genesis 15, and the Lord gave Abram the prophecy that is just about to be fulfilled. All the, all the Perizzites, the Ammonites, all these ites. That's what the Lord told Abram 400 years before this point was going to happen, that one day they'd be in captivity, they would be let out, and they would inherit this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and it's all about to happen. And Moses didn't know any of it. He had no idea of this prophecy. He didn't know how significant this was. He didn't. But bear in mind, the people he was about to go to, they knew the significance of all these city-states. They knew all the promises. They had been praying for this moment, and Moses didn't have a clue about any of it. Now, you would think that Moses would have simply saddled up and headed right back to Egypt. I mean, a burning bush, Lord appearing in this thing, just told him, you're going to go set my people free. I'm going to give you all this land, milk, honey, good things. Leave the sheep, head on back, Moses. You'd think he would have gone right away. Well, not quite right away. Verses 11 through 13. But, <laughs> whenever there's a but in the Bible, we've got to underline it, because usually something's about to happen that's going to get our attention. But, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I want you to remember who Pharaoh was. He knew Pharaoh by first name. At this point, he, he, this was the other Pharaoh. This was the one he was raised with. He played catch with this Pharaoh. He knew who this was. And he's like, <laughs> who am I that I'm going to go back to him? I know who that is. I do not want to go back there. I barely got out of there with my head on, and now you're sending me back? That's Joel's loose translation of what happened. Now, this is what the Bible actually says as we go on, verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign for you, uh, be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain, Mount Horeb, where he's standing. Moses said to God, suppose, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Because Moses didn't know. He didn't know the Lord's name. The name that they had been praying to all this time, Moses didn't know. He knew the name of all the Egyptian gods. He didn't even know God's name, God's real name. Let me put this in layman's terms. Moses just ID'd the Almighty. He just said, can you... 
Can you give me some proof of who you say you are? Moses just ID'd the Almighty here. And then the best part is God actually shows him his ID. He says, look, this is what I am. And he shows him an ID card like no other. This is amazing. I want you to read verses 14 and 15 together from the screens. Okay? Here we go. Verse 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now verse 15. God also said to Moses, come on, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Now he says, I am who I am. That's not the Lord's name. That's his title. Okay, he's saying, it's also a little bit of sarcasm. If we were Hebrew and heard this in Hebrew, you'd really hear a bit of play on words, a bit of a pun here. The Lord is saying, look, you know who I am. They know who I am. You just tell them I am sent you. It's a, it's a little bit sarcastic. He's, he's kind of telling them off just a, a tiny, tiny bit. But then he actually does say his name. You tell them the Lord. Now, we look in our English Bibles and we see that small caps L-O-R-D. And you only see it in the Old Testament because that is the way the English translators are telling us this is the Hebrew for his, his actual name, God's actual name. His name isn't God. That's a description. His name isn't King of Kings. That's a title. His name isn't I am who I am. That's a title. His name is a little complicated. This is what his name looks like in Hebrew. It's the Hebrew letters Yod, uh, He, Vav, He, re reading right to left. Okay? That word does not mean Lord, but that is his actual name. But biblical Hebrew only has consonants, and there are no vowels. Because like a lot of ancient languages, it was an oral language before it was written. So they simply spoke it, and they taught their children how to speak it by hearing it and not by writing it. So then this group of Hebrew uh, scholars came along between the 5th century B.C. and the 6th century A.D. So you're talking pretty good span, but you're talking pretty late in history. They were called the Masoretes. They came along, and they added all the vowels. And they said, well, this is how we heard our fathers and our mothers and our grandfathers and our grandfathers say these words. But they had never heard this pronounced. Because by the time they got to this point in history, by the time the Masoretes had got, gotten on the scene, 5th century in the 4th century B.C., remember B.C. moves towards zero, A.D. moves away from zero. So as they're moving more towards there, they had never heard anyone say this name because by this point in history, they thought the Lord's name was so holy that it should never be profaned by being spoken. Matter of fact, when the scribes would write the Lord's name, they would get the pen and they would throw it into the fire. Because they believed the pen was now, the, the quill was now so holy that it should never be used for anything again than writing the name. In conversation, they would simply say Hashem, which means the name. They would never even try to pronounce it. But the Lord pronounced it to Moses and he said, Use my name. And they called his name. They used his name at this point. They used his name all through the Bible. But by the time you get to where we're living in the 22nd century, we have no clue how to actually say it. But here's what the Masoretes did that gives us a clue. They substitute, when they would read the scripture, it was common practice to substitute the Hebrew word Adonai for this. So this next slide is the word Adonai, what it looks like. So Adonai does mean Lord, which is where we get the Lord from, okay? But it's a generic word. It could be like saying a king is the Lord of the manor, okay? It's a generic word, but here's what it looks like. That's kind of irrelevant. But these little T and the chicken scratch, the dots, those are the vowels, that's what the Masoretes added to show us. This is how it's pronounced. Ah, do. In this case, it's actually ni because it's singular. But the point is, it, those are the vowels. But watch what they did. Okay, go to the next slide, but watch the vowels. They just put the Adonai vowels onto the Lord's name. Because that way when you read along, you would, you would go, oh, oh, don't try to say this word. You just say Adonai. But then they wanted to make doubly sure nobody ever tried to say it, so they changed it just slightly to make it completely unpronounceable, which is this slide. They dropped the vowel point so it actually is unpronounceable, so that no one would ever try to say his name. So we think 
No one knows. We think his name was pronounced either Yahweh, because at the time of Moses, that upside down L looking symbol was pronounced as a V sound, or it could have been Yahweh. It definitely was not Jehovah, because in Hebrew, a four consonant word doesn't have three syllables. It only have two. And there is no J in biblical Hebrew, so it couldn't be Jehovah. It's not Yahweh or Yahweh. It's going to be Yahweh or Yahweh. Who knows? What's amazing to me is that we forgot how to say it. And this was the name he said we can use. This was the name he told Moses. When you get there, you don't just say Hashem. You say Yahweh has sent me. And the meat of the Hebrew elders would have gone, whoa, you do know who he is. Because this wasn't just a regular old name. This was his name. This is the Lord's proper name. So when you see that capital L-O-R-D in your Old Testament, that is the Lord's first name. That is his identity. That is who he is. And so when we go through the rest of this passage, I'm going to say his name as I think it's pronounced. I want you to remember this was the intimacy that the Lord was having with his people. Not some distant God. Not a, not a pantheon like Egypt had. This was Yahweh the covenant-keeping God who was about to deliver his people. So, he, said, he showed, asked for his ID, God gives him his ID, and then he gives him this guarantee of success. He tells him, you're, you're actually going to do this. Verses 16 and 17, he tells, now remember, we're still here at this conversation on the burning bush. Okay, we chased the rabbit trail for the Lord's name, but we're still at Horeb on the bush. The Lord tells Moses, go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey." Another reminder of the promise of Genesis 15 that all those people in Egypt would have known. All those Israelite slaves would have known this promise of Genesis 15. Word for word, they would have recited it, they would have said it, they would have prayed it. And Moses is going to say, saddle up, boys and girls, the Lord's about to deliver. What a great message he had. He didn't understand the significance at the time, but what a message he got to deliver. But the success wouldn't come right away. The Lord adds, verses 19 and 20. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. Those are the plagues that we get to. After that, he will let you go. See, the Lord wanted to make sure this this success would be so amazing and so supernatural that no one would be tempted to worship Moses as the great liberator. As a phenomenal leader as he, did, as he was, he was still a person. Part of my doctorate, I wrote a great deal about Moses and his leadership ability. He was a tour de force. The guy was amazing, but he was still a human, and the Lord didn't want a human getting credit that was only the Lord. So he said, look, Moses, you're not going to set them free. No matter what you say, they're not going, but I will do something that will guarantee success. Then he goes on to the last part of the prophecy from Genesis 15, What we studied on May 29th, but 400 years prior to Moses, verses 21 and 22. And, see the Lord is going, but wait, there's more. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians." just like the Lord said in Genesis 15 was going to happen. I mean, they waited a long time for all this, but he had this guarantee of success at Moses. He did, he, there were a lot of questions he had. Most of what he just was told was pretty good information. He didn't necessarily understand the historical significance. He probably didn't know all the prophecies. He didn't go to low Jewish schools. He was raised as an Egyptian. He wasn't raised with the Lord. He was raised with the pantheon of Egyptian gods. He was raised believing that Pharaoh was nearly a god. 
At this point in history, we're kind of past that. But, you know, there's still a lot of reverence for Pharaoh. He's in that world, and now he's out there on this mountainside with sheep. He doesn't know these things, and yet he's learning these things, and he has so many questions, and there'll be so many questions he still have. He's not even done yet. He still doesn't saddle up and go because he has even more questions, and he's saying, but God, and and, and then, and then, but God, and because, by the way, he, he stuttered. So imagine everything he said took him a long time to say because he's stuttering the whole time. And he's like, I can't even talk, Lord. He's, he's got a hundred excuses, but he knew one thing. He knew God had called him to go. That much he knew. Moses knew that much. And he was willing to act on that much. What about you and me? Do we act on what we know or do we let ourselves get so caught up with what we don't know and all of our questions and all of our doubts and all the unanswered questions and all of this and all of that and all the, what do Christians think about this and what do Christians think about that and what should I do here and what should I, and then we just do nothing. Or do we just get on our horse and just keep riding? Do we just act on what we know while we wait for the Lord to reveal the rest? See, Moses was called by God to be an ambassador for freedom. And you and I, dear one, have also been called. And the Lord who called us calls us to be His ambassadors of freedom. Not political freedom. Spiritual freedom. I I mean, I I have said this so many times. I I get blue in the face almost now. I've said it so many times. I I am a terribly or wonderfully, depending on your perspective, patriotic person. I'm so thankful to live in the nation we live in. You cut me and I bleed red, white, and blue. I mean, Independence Day is my favorite holiday. I mean, to my British friends, I'm just like, happy treason day, British friends. Happy treason day. What are you doing? That There's a friend I have that lives in England. I will send him a message when they hit, well, I think they already have. Sometime tonight, I'll send him a message, and I will ask him, what do the British do on July 4th? Are you sad? Are you happy? I mean, however, the problems in our nation are not political. The problems in our nation are not how this group votes or that group votes. Our problem is spiritual. That is our problem. The core of our issue is not who sits in the White House. It is who is sitting in the the house of our hearts. It is who is sitting in there. That is our problem as a nation. And that we are caught. It's okay to agree with that. Yes, it is. Because if y'all aren't going to amen that, I'll amen that. Amen. That's good preaching, Joel. That's good. Because our job is to be ambassadors of freedom. So if our world stinks, whose fault is it? It's mine. And it's yours. Because we've been called to go out and set people free. Quit shooting the hostages. Get off social media if you can't say something nice about someone who disagrees with you. Quit shooting the hostage. He is, they're not our enemy. The devil's our enemy. And we're so busy going after the people on the opposite party I look, you know, I do not care if you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, Conservative, Liberal, Progressive, Libertarian. I do not care. I really don't care. What I care is if you are a disciple of Jesus, then I already know what your job is. Because it's my job too. It's to be an ambassador for freedom. We'll sort the rest out. Yes, the Lord has something to say about a lot of issues. Yes. But I'm not talking about what we argue on. I'm talking about what do we know? We know this. So act on the information we know. Act on what we know we're supposed to do. We're supposed to get out there and make a difference in our world. That that, that if we're going to say, you know, one nation under God, are you, is your home under God? I mean, it's it's like the song says, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. It's me. It's, am I acting on the information I know? Because the Lord who called us out calls me to be his ambassador of freedom, real freedom, Real, deep, heart, spiritual change. You want to change a nation? Change the souls. That's what you change. That changes everything. I mean, changes all. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. I read this all the time in our history. Prayer, 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 prayer. Always turning ourselves towards God. That's how we change the world. That's how we change our world. So we act on the information we know, which means first we embrace our calling. Embrace the calling you have on your life. If you're a Christian, act like it. I told you several times about a mentor of mine who has jokingly said, he might do it one day at this point in his life, where he has said, one of these days, Easter Sunday, I'm going to walk out and I'm going to stand dead center of the platform and I'm going to say, Jesus is alive. Act like it and walk off. 
I mean, because think about it. If, if, if we embrace this calling of what we know, that we're disciples of Jesus and we're called to be his ambassadors of freedom to deliver people from darkness to light, and that's our mission, let's act like it. I mean, we, we, we get the greatest job in the world. We get to show people Jesus. Oh, but Joel, they have all these questions. Sure, I have questions too. Big deal. Embrace our calling. Don't get excited. Eventually, you, you got to stop talking about the weather and start talking about Jesus. Embrace the calling, which also means act on your calling. Act on that. Take that next step. I encourage people to make lists because when you write something down, it's real. And I'm a real techie. I have a lot of tech on me and up here, but I still write some things down, like by hand, with my left hand because I'm left handed, and I actually write. Nobody can read it but me, but that's a different story. I write. Even my wife can't read it. But one thing I want to encourage you to write is write those people around you who are still living in Egypt. Not a physical Egypt, of course, spiritual Egypt. They're still slaves to sin. Because what if God has called you? Ah, let me change that. Because God has called you to be the Moses to them, to lead them out of spiritual slavery into his marvelous light. You are their Moses. You are their liberator. Of course, Jesus does the saving. No one's questioning that. But you're Jesus with skin on. And you're the one showing them this stuff changes your life. And this stuff moves you. Moses was moved by the word of the Lord. Are you? Are you moved by that? When he said, go and make disciples, that means you and me in our little world, we act on that calling. You say, Joel, my world is so small. Okay, and? Oh, but, but Joel, I don't see that many people. I bet there's at least one there that needs to know the love of Jesus. I bet there's at least one. Or maybe, maybe you're in a workplace where you're like, man, nobody is a Christian where I work. It's just a terrible work environment. I don't, I don't know that sensation. I work in a church. But the other side of that is you're right in the middle of Egypt. What a great opportunity. What a great opportunity to look at the devil and say, let my people go. I'm going after these people, and you're letting them. I'm going after them. I, I'm with them every day, and I'm going to tell them about Jesus until they fire me or they just turn. I mean, they're not going to have much of a choice, okay? I'm going to love them to Jesus. Act on it. Just act your calling. Eventually, we've got to stop trying to sit around and figure out all the list of theolog theological ideas and philosophical thoughts and what does it mean to be a Christian in America and how, how much America and politics do we inject in Christianity and how much do we keep it separate. Enough. Do what you're supposed to do. That's what Moses was being told to do. He was told on Mount Horeb, tending sheep, that you're about to go back to the very place you thought you were never going to have to go back to again. But you're going to go there for a specific mission to liberate people. And every day, the Lord sends you and me into a place to liberate people. Not to change their political affiliation. That's up to the Lord. Not to convince them how right you are. To show them how good Jesus is. Love always precedes truth. You can write that one down too. Love always precedes truth. You can't give truth until you have proven you love them and you're going to stick with them through all that. Love has to precede that. You've got to lead with that. And then you love them to Jesus. And then you tell them the truth. That Because, look, look, here's what we're saying. Here's what we're saying. We're saying that apart from Jesus, what happens to those friends and family members that are still in Egypt that are on that list? They go to hell apart from Jesus. Is that worth anything to you? Does that matter? Does that keep you up at night? Does that make you sweat just a little bit going, man, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to say anymore. Great. That's a good spot because that's where Moses was going, Lord, I don't even know what to say. And he goes, you tell him about me. That's what he's telling you. If hell is really that hot and there's a heaven to gain, why are we ever silent? This is the best news ever. Because the one that called Moses has called us, and he's calling us to be his ambassadors of freedom. So go, set them free. Show them this is the best life they could ever live today, and certainly the best life they're ever going to live in eternity.